you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, various models for overturning psychedelic prohibition and what, you know, what it means to make psychedelics available, you know, at a mass scale. Like, what is that? What does the model look like? And, and what is the tipping point at which we really see this paradigm shift that you say that we so desperately need as a species? Um, can you talk to us a, lo a little bit about this? I mean, oh, it's happening now. It's ha there's a revolution from the underground. I know I when I first got into this psilocybin mushroom scene in the 70s, I was literally treated like a leper. I had a long haired hippie. I go to the medical conferences or the mycological conference. Con it's like I had this contagion. I walk into a crowd and there'd be a buffer of space that people didn't want to be associated with me because I was interested in psilocybin mushrooms. Boy, has that changed. When I first went to TED and did my TED talk, they warned me, don't talk about psilocybin mushrooms. Don't you dare. Now I'll be on main stage talking about psilocybin mushrooms. Well, the, the times have really changed. But you know, no matter what the commercialization is by these companies, including even what I do, uh, and these other companies that are, that are commercializing and getting in to the commercialization of psilocybin, the fact is folks, 95, 99, who knows, percent of the people are gonna be taking psilocybin mushrooms in a natural form. You can grow them at home. Um, a ballot measure 109 and 110 passed in Oregon. This is huge. The therapeutic use of psilocybin in Oregon is ballot 109. The decriminalization of, of drugs, uh, plant-based medicines and mushrooms uh, in, in Oregon through the decrim movement, which I'm a strong supporter of. And there's a lot of controversy at first because I think they passed by 57, 58% of the vote. And people were really concerned that 109, um, you know, 110 is competing with 109. Um, but I don't, I see the two pistons of the same engine because what it ballot measure 110 does, which is fantastic, is they take the marijuana tax revenue and they use that tax revenue uh, for therapy, therapeutic use and treating addiction and uh, using these entheogenic substances to help fight it, addiction, depression, anxiety, and for therapeutic use. Well, one on not therapeutic use. So interestingly, these two groups were at sometimes in opposition to each other, but the, the ballot 1010 now creates the financial vehicle to fund the therapeutic use of psilocybin as passed by ballot 109. So 1010 helps 109. And then there's a ballot 81 in Washington, D.C., which is the decriminalization of most all drugs, hard drugs as well. Um, and that passed by like a whopping 75 percent uh, of the voters in Washington, D.C., in the belly of the beast. Maybe they know they needed it more than anyone. <laughs> so but this is this is now a world It's a state the, the Oregon being the first state. There's going to be now many, many states and many countries, I think, are going to wake up to this. And in my other lectures, I cite several other meta studies that a single dose of psilocybin is correlated with the statistically significant reduction in crime, violent crime, larceny, and burglary. Think of that. These are non addictive drugs, but if you've had one psilocybin experience, statistically significant reduction from 16, I think, to 22%. There's a big meta study, hundreds of thousands of people, prisoners that were surveyed. And the, the correlation um, is not always causation, but in this case, it looks like it is. That a single use of psilocybin mushrooms is related or the reduction in criminal behavior. Any law enforcement officer out there, any judge, any government official thinks about how much money we could save in our budgets how law enforcement can focus on on more targeted relations and not busting people for possession for a few mushrooms, you know, uh, in their possession when they know that the mushrooms actually will reduce criminal behavior. I mean, this is a game changing societal breakthrough is the use of these psychedelics, you know, psilocybin in particular, other compo compounds, you know, I iboga, ayahuasca, um, MDMA, et cetera also have similar trend lines that show that these things positively change people's lives for the better 
and also serves the commons because the reduction of the cost of the courts and uh, and all of us know people who've been arrested either uh, for good reason or for bad, but, but it's traumatizing. It's traumatizing to the immediate family. It's traumatizing to your cousins, your uncles, your aunts. It's traumatizing to your neighbors. It's traumatizing to the outer community. Now, what if we could throw a psilocybin pebble into the pond of consciousness? Psilocybin mushroom. The reverberations coming out from that experience has the opposite effect. You're more compassionate, you're more empathetic, you're more generous, you're kinder. You know, these, this is really an important medicine for our society. And, it's, and indigenous peoples have known this for so long. Um, and it's taken modern society an, an exceptionally long time to wake up. And it's, you know, indigenous peoples under so much pressure and threat and disease and war and religious persecution. It's extraordinary that they've been able to survive to the point they are now. But now we need to build upon that. And um, when with indigenous peoples, you know, I have some pretty potent things to say that may not make most many people happy. Um, but I, I would like to elocute on that just for a minute, unless you have another question. No, we'd love to hear it. We are a big, big supporters of sacred reciprocity at Double Blind and think it's really important that psychedelic users think about indigenous communities. So please do go ahead. Well, I mean, it's come into focus many times, but there was a initiative in Oakland, um, the decrim movement, and I'm gonna just very generally describe and maybe misdescribe some of, some, of the, um, some of the things that happened, but basically the Native American church was not consulted. Uh, when they put pay on decriminalization, um, that was a that was a misstep. I don't think it was intentionally evil, or but it was definitely not being fully conscious of the rights of indigenous peoples. When it comes to psilocybin mushrooms, there's 116 species of psilocybin active mushrooms in the genus Psilocybe. You know, 116 psilocybe species that contains psilocybin out of a genus that has about 216. So more than half the species in the genus philosophy are psilocybin active. They grow all over the world. And the use of psilocybin mushrooms goes back to Greek times and to Northern Africa and to Europe and England, of course, in, in, in Mesoamerica, uh, you know, in South America, uh, Mexico, um, you know, Perhaps the Pacific Northwest, there's, there's no documentation that, that's been, that I've seen that's been very convincing, but I can't imagine they wouldn't, you know, any indigenous people living in their ecosystem are pretty conscious of these things. But my point is that the use of psilocybin is circumpolar. It joins call together. It's a bridge. It's a, it's a psychedelic bridge that unifies us to, as one people together. Now, when it comes to peyote, I think it's a very special category. The Wichols and, and the Yaki and the other indigenous people and, um, and the more arid regions, you know, of the Southeast uh, North America, you know, it's part of their peyote hunt is part of the cultural, it's part of their vision quest. And I just really feel we can go San Pedro at home, et cetera. Yes. But I just feel very strongly that peyote is a sacrament that should be reserved for the people whose, whose life spiritual paths are dependent upon it indigenously. And so what I'm kind of saying is psilocybin has a different story. Uh, peyote has a unique uh, ethnocentricity that is absolutely critical to protect for the indigenous people. So, um, as I said, I'll be controversial. Now, when I, now ayahuasca kind of fits in the category as well. I mean, you know, lots of amazing, you know, breakthroughs in ayahuasca, but I was down in Cusco, Peru, and if you haven't been down there, there's neon signs flashing, not one, not two, hundreds of them, flashing ayahuasca ceremonies to, uh, for ecotourism or psych psychonautic tourism. 
it's weird. It's it just doesn't feel right. So and then the Iboga, you know, is also threatened um, in in Africa. I'm not saying that these systems aren't useful. I'm saying they're very useful, but they come with them. With them, their use becomes with a responsibility to respect the indigenous people's wishes on how these products are going to be used. Now, that being said, no offense to indigenous peoples, but they're not immune either from having bad actors. So you can be an indigenous person and be a bad actor exploiting your heritage and these medicines for selfish purposes. So, you know, all have this spectrum of personalities within our communities. But just as a general statement. I think it's really important that indigenous people's rights are respected. Um, and the advantage that indigenous peoples have had is they have the structures for the responsible use of this for maximum benefit within our communities. And um, it's something that we need to learn from, understand, have a dialogue. But can we at least leave peyote alone for the indigenous peoples that need it so well? Because the rapid decline of peyote is a threat to our cultural heritage. Okay, that's my opinion. <laughs> thank you for this. No, thank you for it. We appreciate it. And, you know, issue four comes out in December, and we actually have a long, beautifully written feature by journalist Tracy Barnett about the Weechels and their, their struggles over to preserve the, um, it's called the birthplace of the sun, the desert there, where they've m migrated for generations to collect their sacred peyote. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, you can do so in the upcoming magazine. Um, and also, we'll be sure to send out um, in our follow-up email with resources. Shakruna has put out some really important work around um, sacred reciprocity and the responsible use of indigenous plant medicine. So definitely an ongoing conversation we want to be having.